Gothamites came out in full force today, overrunning polling stations across the city, waiting up to three hours in some precincts to cast their votes. News of the record-breaking turnout, though, was eclipsed by yet another story of the masked vigilante known as the Batman. Around 5 p.m., three men armed with baseball bats arrived at this polling station, allegedly threatened voters and destroyed Harvey Dent campaign posters. Before the threats escalated, Batman appeared on the scene, quickly disarming each of the men and leaving them beaten and bound to a tree for the authorities. Gotham PD has placed all three men under arrest, identifying one of them as Albert Rossi, a reputed member of the Falcone crime family. Good evening, I'm Mike Engel, and this is a special edition of Gotham Tonight, continuing GCN's up-to-the-minute coverage on Election 08. The attack by three thugs and subsequent retaliation by Batman captured the media's attention tonight. But tomorrow's headlines will be about Harvey Dent, who posted a resounding landslide victory in the most talked-about race in the election, the race for district attorney. Joining us tonight to discuss the turn of events, we welcome Dent's opponents, acting district attorney, Mr. Roger Garcetti, the president of Gotham's Victim Advocate Foundation, Dana Worthington, as well as Alan Sipes, media manager for the Harvey Dent campaign. I thank you all for being here. The race for district attorney was by far the most watched race in the election, but doesn't it seem pointless to elect a district attorney when a vigilante who continues to take the law into his own hands is seen by both the public and the authorities alike as their one and only protector? Well, that was the case, uh, Mike. How do you explain the voter turnout today? You know, Batman wasn't on the ballot. Harvey Dent was. And in fact, 96% of the people that voted for him said in the exit polls that Dent has come to represent something much more than just a candidate for office. He is the face of a new era in Gotham, one that no longer requires the services of the Batman. Alan, wouldn't that require the Batman to play along? I mean, who's going to make this guy retire? You? <laughs> Mr. Garcetti, one of the platforms is to incarcerate the Batman. Now, do you think he's going to just lay down his arms when Harvey Dent takes over? He may not get a chance. Harvey Dent has almost the entire police department under investigation. <laughs> Here we go, Mike. Honestly, this guy is... Hold on, let's stick to the point. Mr. Garcetti, why do you think the Batman should be brought to justice? A man who takes the law into his own hands, even in the name of justice, is by definition breaking the law. No, 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 I don't agree, Mike. Uh, I am opposed to the idea of sanctioning the existence of a vigilante, but in desperate times... Now, how much of a choice do we have? As you know... I have been president of Gotham's Victims Advocate Foundation going on about 12 years now, and during that period, neither the police nor the DA's office have properly looked after the victims of crime, especially the ones from the lower economic class. These people have only received justice when it was convenient for the city to obtain it. I guess Ms. Worthington forgot that during my term of office, the overall crime rate has dropped significantly. Excuse no, me, that's... you can only massage let statistics. Let me jump in here. If you look you at the that. numbers, no, the... I... let me jump in here, folks. If you look at the numbers, the incidences of violent crimes, I mean, sex crimes, robberies, assaults, even organized crime activities, have declined in the last several months alone. I mean, someone's doing something right out there. Ms. Worthington? Yes, that's right, and that someone is Batman. Now, since he's appeared in Gotham, I can honestly tell you that the lives of my clients have changed tremendously. Now, no matter how scarred or hurt they may be, they are no longer afraid because uh. they know, they know that he is out there watching over them. I want to know whether Mr. Dent is going to hunt this man down or is he going to let Batman continue to do the good work that he's doing? Alan Sipes, is Harvey Dent going to make it a priority to go after the Batman once he's in office? Uh, well, I've got to be honest with you, Mike. Batman is kind of irrelevant at this point. Uh, Gotham has its true protector now, and that man is Harvey Dent. This is a, a man who's not afraid to go after the mob, or, or any of the other criminals for that matter, uh, without wearing a mask. He is bold. I'll grant him that. Why the refusal to do interviews, Alan? Why won't Harvey Dent come on the show? What is he afraid of? He's not afraid of, of anything, Mike. He's just busy. In fact, you know what he's doing right now? He's in his office working to put Sal Maroney on trial as promised. Now, isn't that exactly what you want from your district attorney? The only people Harvey Dent has put on trial are the police. Hard-working, innocent cops. No. Mike, nearly every cop that Harvey Dent has prosecuted has been found guilty. And each of those convictions have led to uh, information on corruption that stems right back to the Falcone crime family, of which uh, Sal Maroney the, the is head, The accusation that Sal Maroney is somehow involved with the department is completely unfounded. If there was any evidence to the contrary, I would have indicted Mr. Maroney myself. But Mr. Dent isn't interested in the truth. He just wants to justify his witch hunt into the Gotham PD. A witch hunt that has persecuted the very people who every day put their lives on the line to protect the rest of us. Uh, tell me, Mike, you know, just how effective do you think this new era of Gotham is going to be when the face behind it has alienated the entire police force with his internal affairs investigations? What do you think happens to law and order when you go after the law? It's a valid point, Mr. Garcetti. Alan, 
Dent's internal affairs investigations have uncovered corruption within the department. But at what cost? He's going to need these guys pitted against the criminals, right? I mean, not himself. Mike, uh, Mike, this is why I Jump find in, myself Morgan, embracing please. the Batman. Now, Batman has no politics. He has no agenda other than removing the if criminals from the streets. If you want to put on some crazy costume and go declare war on the criminals, well, that's what you're going to get. I don't... War. Because the criminal-minded people of this town don't go quietly into the night. If you go after them with violence, they'll come right back at you with more violence. Well, you, you, you should, you should know, Mr. Garcetti. This guy's more than a costume. What? Jump in, Al. I said that. you should know, Mr. Garcetti. Should know what, Al? Sh should know how the criminally-minded are going to react to the net that Harvey Dent is, is tightening around them. It doesn't surprise me that a man like Roger Garcetti can understand how Harvey Dent has made the Gotham PD a stronger police force by rooting out the ring of corruption that threatened to bring it down. Corruption that Mr. Garcetti himself has had a hand in. What did you now, say? Through this entire election, Mike, we've endured smear campaigns and character assassinations what? perpetrated no, no. by Mr. You, Garcetti you. and his friends, like the ones who tried to threaten our supporters no, you're today. Right out and of never line. once did Harvey Dent stoop to his level to retaliate. But now that the election is over, we can reveal that Mr. Garcetti, former chief legal consultant, the, to the Gotham Police Union and a trustee to the Filipazzo Community Foundation, both organizations, interestingly enough, with oh. strong ties to Sal Maroney, will be under investigation no, for misuse for of power and acceptance of bribes and will There's, be prosecuted look, look, to the full you, extent of the law. You and your guy better be real careful. You think your white knight doesn't have any chinks in his armor? Well, you think again. Is that a threat, Mr. Garcetti? No, you figure it out for yourselves. No, you turn that camera off. I think we lost Mr. Garcetti. Well, like I said, Mike, judge and jury, it's a lot less complicated, making it a lot less corruptible. Well, and so is a man of the utmost integrity, intelligence, and, and conviction, Dana. You know, when you meet someone like that, you, you can't help but believe in them. And I believe in Harvey Dent. And I'm very proud to say that Gotham does, too. Well, I will as well if we can get Mr. Dent to come in here and join us on the show. Any chance of that happening, Alan? Uh, well, I'll do what I can, Mike. I want to thank all my guests, Roger Garcetti, Dana Worthington, and Alan Sipes. We will, of course, keep you updated on the pending investigation against the former district attorney. In the meantime, join us in two weeks as we take a closer look at exactly what Harvey Dent is up against in his war on crime. The mob is one thing, but how will he combat a recent rash of sensational offenses committed by criminals that seem to have no motive at all? And next week, check out our profile on Gotham's most eligible and untamed bachelor, Bruce Wayne as we try to determine who the real man is behind the one in the headlines. We thank you for watching. More election coverage on the hour. This is Gotham Tonight. Movie stars, there are rock stars, and there are sports stars, but there is only one Bruce Wayne. The mega billionaire playboy is Gotham City's most notable celebrity, whose name is synonymous with extravagance, mischief, and occasional recklessness. Despite his prominent place in the public eye, very little is known about the man who appears to have no causes nor endeavors other than acting as figurehead to his late father's company, Wayne Enterprises. But it's in this position that Wayne has great influence over the entire city. So much influence that stock analysts and business experts are worried that his party boy antics could plunge Gotham into another depression. Hi everyone, I'm Lydia Phil and Jerry, and tonight we explore a wild life that knows no boundaries, hoping to find a man who is ready to start taking some responsibilities. comes to my restaurant and he's got six very pretty ladies with him. I says to him, Mr. Wayne, I know who you are, but I only got 20 tables here and I'm booked all night. There's nowhere to seat you. He puts a piece of paper in my hand and he tells me, you make the best risotto in town. It's time for a little expansion, right? I open the piece of paper. It's the deed to the place next door. Mr. Wayne ate very well that night, let me tell you. And now, I got 100 tables to my name. This is just one of many similar stories about the billionaire who will stop at nothing to get the best seat in the house, the fastest car on the street, and the hottest gals in town. Bruce Wayne lives life like it's a Monopoly board and he's playing all by himself. But it hasn't always been fun and games for the eternal playboy. 
A moment of unexpected tragedy ruptured his storybook life and set him off on a course that he never thought he would travel. That event was the tragic and violent loss of his parents as a young boy. Born to Thomas and Martha Wayne, young Bruce was born into a life of wealth and extravagance. It was Judge Solomon Wayne who commissioned architect Cyrus Pinckney in 1851 to construct Gotham's financial district. In the center of this district, a merchant house was opened under the name of Wayne Corp. Providing merchants with a variety of goods, the family business became a staple in the flourishing city, generating an endless stream of revenue. Despite the vast family fortune, though, his parents continued to work. His father operated the largest free clinic in the city and used Wayne Enterprises to launch public works projects, like the construction of the city's monorail system. While his mother became a community activist leader and part-time teacher in some of the city's most dangerous areas. They were Gotham City's patron saints, for sure. The Waynes were not only two of my best friends, but they did so much for charity. And if I could nominate them for sainthood, I would. Their philanthropy inspired others into action, but just before they could completely help those affected by the ongoing depression, the unspeakable happened. Thomas and Martha Wayne were gunned down outside the Gotham Opera House in front of their 10-year-old son. As the last remaining member of the Wayne family, Bruce became the sole heir of the family's fortune as well as the head of Wayne Enterprises. Custody of the boy was granted to the family's butler, Alfred Pennyworth, who tried tirelessly to calm his young master as he began to act out in response to his parents' demise. When his parents' murderer cut a deal to testify against a Gotham City mob boss and was subsequently assassinated by an alleged mob hitman, Bruce Wayne disappeared without a trace for the better part of seven years. Various reports had him yachting around the Pacific, while others cited him living in Brazil owning and operating a local modeling agency. But without any contact or proof of life from the billionaire, reports of his whereabouts dwindled, culminating in the declaration of his death by his trusted guardian, Alfred Pennyworth. In his absence, Wayne Enterprises came under the control of William Earl, who initiated the flotation of the company. In the process of going public, though, Gotham got a big surprise when Bruce Wayne resurrected himself from the dead just in time to purchase enough stock to become the majority shareholder in the company. Regaining his authority, Wayne secured himself a position as CEO while entrusting all the work and responsibility to Lucius Fox, which many consider the smartest move Wayne ever made. Bruce's return to Gotham seemed permanent as he took up residence in his family's ancestral home, Wayne Manor. However, any thoughts of a newfound maturity quickly subsided with the news of a drunken episode that resulted in the burning down of the palatial estate during a birthday bash. Homeless and forced to relocate, the Playboy has recently landed here atop this newly built luxury tower where Wayne has purchased a two-story, 25,000-square-foot penthouse apartment with 40-foot ceilings, two gigantic balconies, a parking space for his helicopter, and a 360-degree view of the entire city below. The price? Who knows? But the monthly maintenance fee alone is reported to be around $31,000. The real perk is the location, though. Over the course of the last few months, Bruce has made appearances at all of Gotham's ultra-posh eateries, clubs, and lounges, creating a commotion wherever he goes with a gaggle of gorgeous women in tow. In fact, just last month, escorting all 150 Miss Earth contestants, Bruce accidentally crashed a Harvey Dent fundraising event at the city's newest hotel, the Gotham Grand. Wayne and Dent have never met, but both know Rachel Dawes. An old and loyal friend to Bruce, Rachel has recently become something more to Harvey Dent as the two have been seen around town together occasionally holding hands. Whether Bruce approves, no one knows for sure. But Ms. Dawes disapproved of the distraction caused by Wayne's impromptu appearance, asking Bruce to leave the event almost immediately. When asked about the incident and Bruce Wayne, Harvey Dent told reporters... You know, look, I mean, what happened to Bruce's family? Uh, and other people like him. It's just, it's, it's unconscionable uh, that a kid should have to endure that in Gotham, a family that's been so good to this town. I'll do whatever I can to prevent something like that from ever happening again. Later that night, reporters caught up with Wayne at the popular sushi restaurant, Raw. 
I don't know Harvey Dent. You know, and I, I, I try to stay away from politicians, though, you know, you never know what you're going to get with those guys. But if anyone is for abolishing the speeding ticket, they got my vote. Like him or not, Bruce Wayne is our very own Peter Pan, armed with a limitless trust fund that acts as a sword. His adventures do make for great headlines in the tabloids. But unlike the mythic boy who never has to grow up, Wayne has real responsibilities that affect us all. Responsibilities that include overseeing Wayne Enterprises, which has been Gotham's economic core for over a century. Over the last few months, Wayne Enterprises has acquired and or developed technologies emanating from abandoned aerospace and military programs. Programs that have produced specialized fabrics, electromagnetic gyroscopic navigational systems, hemostatic powders, high-tech plastics, radiation stamping technology, and rotor blades made of metal composites that have a low radar signature and special acoustic design. Vice President of Operations, Douglas Fredericks. Is there logic to any of this, or is Bruce Wayne just manufacturing parts for some expensive toys he wants to play with? Lydia, the space program not only put a man on the moon, but it introduced the world to Velcro. But we're talking about stealth rotor blades here. I mean, where is the practical use in that? What some may consider niche or off-the-wall technology, we view as doors to the future, and our strides through those doors will strengthen this company and the community around it. The jury is still out whether these ventures are helping or hurting the company. In fact, one stock analyst is calling for the board to remove Wayne as CEO before he causes the city to enter into another depression. On the other hand, another analyst is telling investors that Bruce Wayne might be the perfect person to usher Wayne Enterprises into the next generation by taking risks on technology that could change the world for the better. But. Since it's impossible to tell whether the card of the Playboy sleeve is an ace or just a joker, the future of Wayne Enterprises will remain uncertain. Thanks so much for watching us. Join us in two weeks as we profile another one of Gotham's familiar faces, Lieutenant Jim Gordon, head of the newly formed Major Crimes Unit in the Gotham Police Department. And don't miss next week's show when Mike Engel takes us through Gotham City's underworld in an attempt to expose the bizarre criminal elements that pose a threat to us all. I'm Lydia Fillingeri, and this is Gotham Tonight. Crime. It is as common to a modern-day society as air and water. And as long as there is a group of people who live in want, there will always be individuals willing to do anything they can, rob, cheat, or kill, to satisfy their needs. But in Gotham, crime has started to emanate from a different place. Over the last few weeks, there's been a rise in crimes without motive that are so demented, none of us can understand why they were committed. I'm Mike Engel, and tonight we delve into the city's underground to get a status report on just how bad it is on our streets. Now, we do this not to frighten you. We do this only to inform you of a growing problem that threatens our city. The last thing we want is for you to be in a situation similar to what Steve and Andrea Otis found themselves in with their 17-year-old son. The police said um, he took something they call ecstasy. It's supposed to give you a feeling of euphoria. It's still hard for us to uh, believe what happened, especially to a boy like Tim. Did he ever use drugs before, or was that night the first time? As far as we it's know... It's the only time he ever took drugs, ever. Steve and Andrea's son, Tim, graduated high school last May and was on his way to a top university when he and his friends celebrated the night away here. Known for lax underage drinking enforcement and an abundance of recreational drugs, teenagers of all kinds came here to experiment with a life that their parents tried so hard to keep them from. That night, it was Tim Otis's turn. Upon ingesting the drug called ecstasy, Tim collapsed to the floor and immediately went into a violent seizure. His friends called an ambulance fearing that he was suffering from an overdose or a bad reaction. Neither was the case. After they called us, we rushed to the hospital, and there he was, screaming at the top of his lungs, tied to the gurney. The doctors had to restrain him because Tim kept trying to tear his own eyes out. They couldn't control him. He was terrified. 
The family's nightmare was unending, alarming Tim's doctors and the other medical examiners that this was something more than just a bad trip. Theorizing that the drugs may have been laced with a malicious substance, Tim's blood was tested for traces of foreign chemicals. What they found frightened everyone. Tim's bloodstream was laden with the chemical compound used by Dr. Jonathan Crane to produce his lethal fear toxin, the same toxin that nearly destroyed all of Gotham. James Levine writes the police beat for the Gotham Times. He's also written two books on the history of organized crime in Gotham and is writing a third on the terrorist attack that occurred in the Narrows. James, this is some scary stuff. Scary indeed. Now, before we get into this further and discuss whether Dr. Jonathan Crane is behind it all, let's start off where organized crime stands these days. Harvey Dent recently indicted Sal Maroney. Maroney is allegedly the heir to Carmine Falcone, who was incarcerated and later suffered debilitating psychological damage at the hands of Dr. Crane. Well, you know, Mike, what's really interesting about all this is that uh, Falcone's removal from power provoked other criminal factions in Gotham to go after pieces of Falcone's empire. Now, Sal Maroney made it clear that this wasn't a good idea. However, Maroney, who prides himself on being a charmer when he's more of a schemer, has reportedly embraced these other criminal organizations rather than declaring war against them. Embrace them how? Well, reports suggest that Maroney and the rest of Gotham's criminal factions have uh, banded together. And statistics support this, as there's been absolutely no incidences of violence between these factions in the last couple of months, which is remarkable given the, uh, the vicious history of organized crime within this city. James, wait a second. What you're saying, then, is this some sort of detente? No, no. What I'm saying is uh, some kind of conglomeration. The various factions have joined together to form a larger syndicate, which, to be blunt, is far worse than having them kill each other. Uh, now what you have is a uh, mob on steroids with their hands in every pot and their fists in every face. Essentially, it's an impenetrable force of highly organized crime, uh, impenetrable even to back. Okay, hold, hold on. Let me, let me stop you right there. This is what gets me mad, okay? Now, to me, the biggest problem facing Gotham right now is the fact that the public is embracing a vigilante as their protector. You mean the Batman? Yes, the Batman. I mean, a man who refuses to reveal his identity, a man who isn't even voted upon by the public, a man we don't even know if he's human, James. <laughs> what do you think, Mike? He's a bat? Look, a number of eyewitness accounts have put him at different places at the exact same time. I mean, how do you explain that to the people of Gotham? No, Mike, Mike, you've been ridiculous. Let me make my point. Let me make my point. The point is this mega mob that you are telling us is such a threat, my feeling is that the Batman is worse. Because before you know it, he's going to inspire the whole city to take the law into their own hands. And what do we have? We have anarchy, complete and utter chaos. You ever think where we would be without Batman? Now, that would be chaos. Our government has broken its social contract with its citizens, Mike, one that promised justice, order, and security. When that contract is violated, someone needs to rise up and repair it. Batman has. Now, what about Harvey Dent, James? Can't he do that for the city of Gotham? Harvey Dent will play a big part in this, but he can't do it alone. This city is facing some major threats. What happened to the Otis kid? Tip of the iceberg. You bring up a good point. Now, what about this case, James? The police say that Dr. Crane is, in fact, dead. The situation with these spiked drugs speaks to a very different situation. Well, what we know is that Dr. Jonathan Crane was, in fact, involved in the fear toxin assault on the Narrows nine months ago. No, come on. Everybody knows that Crane is dead. Mike, his body was never recovered. And the hundreds of Arkham inmates that escaped from the asylum disappeared during the attack. Now, what happened to them? No one knows. But... There have been several sightings of a man who fits Crane's description leading an army of what is described as truly disturbed people. Now, what leads me to believe these sightings are indeed valid is one recurring detail in them all. Which is? The man leading the pack wears a burlap sack over his head, which was part of a scare tactic the doctor implemented on his inmates. There's certainly some very strange stuff. <laughs> a man with six fingers is strange, Mike. This, this is alarming. My only hope is it doesn't get any worse, but when you hear stories like the one about the large shipment of ammonium nitrate that was stolen off the docks last week by a perpetrator who was crazy enough to smile into the surveillance camera, I start to think it's time to move to another city. You have any idea what a lunatic can do with that much ammonium nitrate, Mike? Well, build a bomb, potentially. No, no, build a big bomb. Let me ask you this in our remaining 30 seconds, James. There is, to me, no doubt here that there's a growing trend of uh, deranged crimes that are being perpetrated by equally deranged individuals for motives that are unknown to us all. Meanwhile, we have a man that's dressed up like a bat who is literally waging war on the city streets. I mean, you don't think one has to do with the other. I mean, that is to say, Batman, whether he's a hero or a nutcase, is encouraging and actually inspiring other nutcases to do what, either stop him or top him. Well, I haven't thought about it like that. Potentially, yes. Well, th that's why the Batman's gotta be stopped. I mean, he's gotta be brought to justice to stop the escalation. James, we thank you for being with us today. 
and thank you for watching. Please join me in two weeks for an interview with the head of the Falcone crime family, Sal Maroney, who claims Commissioner Loeb and the Gotham PD should be the real defendants in Harvey Dent's case against him. And next week, tune into Lydia Phil and Jerry's profile on the rising star within Gotham's police department, Lieutenant Jim Gordon. Will Lieutenant Gordon be the man who will turn this city around? Or does Gordon's rumored association to the Batman cast a shadow of doubt on him that Harvey Dent should be concerned about? I'm Mike Engel. Good evening. This is Gotham Tonight. In the wake of the devastation that occurred in the Narrows, Gotham PD came under heavy criticism for its poor performance in preventing the terrorist plot to destroy the city. Subsequently, a series of internal affair investigations headed up by Harvey Dent, now District Attorney Harvey Dent, revealed a pervasive level of corruption throughout the department. In desperate need of a facelift, Police Commissioner Loeb lobbied City Hall to create an elite investigative unit solely dedicated to solving the major crimes plaguing Gotham City. The request was granted on the condition that the unit was to be led by an officer with an exemplary history of duty and the proven ability to get the results. That man is Lieutenant Jim Gordon. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lydia Phil and Jerry, and tonight we profile Gotham's top cop, examining his rise to power and his current command over the elite major crimes unit. Does Gordon really have what it takes to protect this city, or will his rumored relationship with the masked vigilante known as the Batman demand the new district attorney to investigate the last honest cop on the force? The morning after the deadly chemical attack on the Narrows that infected thousands of residents and policemen, set free hundreds of dangerous Arkham Asylum inmates, and also provoked riots that lasted for weeks as authorities fought to regain control of the island. Batman was praised for thwarting the unknown terrorist group, while the Gotham police brass were condemned for their handling of the disaster, particularly for the decision to raise the bridges, preventing safe exits off the island. Commissioner Loeb sidestepped charges of negligence by detailing the heroism of one of Gotham's finest, who valiantly led the rescue effort in the Narrows and helped Batman stop the train that threatened to poison all of Gotham with the lethal fear toxin. A 15-year veteran of the Gotham Police Department, Jim Gordon was awarded citations of valor and bumped up to lieutenant for his efforts that night. Gotham embraced the husband and father of two as one of their own, and Gordon's family understands why. If he didn't feel he could keep us safe, if he didn't feel he could help the city and keep himself safe, he would resign. That's the kind of man he is. He wouldn't try to do a job he didn't think he was up to do. The city needs him and he knows it. Gordon's clean record and unbreakable determination make him widely considered as the modern day Elliot Ness generating for the first time in a long time good press for a police force desperately in need of it. The good press quickly went south, though, when then Assistant District Attorney Harvey Dent spearheaded multiple internal affairs investigations into Gotham PD. Among the several indicted and later convicted was Gordon's former partner, Detective Flass, provoking outrage among the department. I don't condone the actions of the officers who were convicted. But if I showed you how much the city allows me to pay them, you might understand why somebody may slip from time to time. But rather than acknowledge that problem, though, Dent likes to make waves by saying that the whole institution is corrupt. Well, I doubt I'll have any complaints about my decision to give Jim Gordon MCU. He's the perfect man for the job. Now, if you don't mind, I got a meeting to run to. Excuse me. Anointing Gordon as the head of Major Crimes Unit restored credibility to the department. City leaders brandished the new division, the incorruptible arm of law enforcement. The recent months have challenged that notion, though, as Gordon and MCU have yet to solve any cases while conducting some curious investigations. Although Harvey Dent is not exploring the matter at this time, a leak from his camp stated that many within MCU have been considered persons of interest. Are those persons of interest detectives handpicked by Gordon? or Gordon himself, who may or may not be working in conjunction with the Batman. Seen numerous times in the sky above Gotham, look close enough and one can make out the symbol of a bat. 
The source of the light emanates from the rooftop of major crimes, which some believe acts as Gordon's personal beacon to the mass vigilante. Gordon has a different explanation, though. Faulty lighting equipment. I've been trying to fix it myself. But don't tell my wife that. She's been bugging me to change the bulbs in the basement for weeks. Gordon may jokingly pass off his rumored alliance with the Batman, but if there's any truth to it, then it's hardly a laughing matter in the light of recent murders of two Sal Moroni associates. Last Wednesday morning, two teachers and a group of second graders discovered the dead bodies of Romeo Camera and Steve Rizzolio bound, gagged, and tied to opposite ends of a seesaw. If you wanted to know where the mob keeps its money, these are the guys you want. Could the Batman, hailed by some while abhorred by others, have crossed the line in waging his war against the mob? And most important, if Gotham's top cops encounters with a man who remains on Gotham's most wanted list is the beginning of some sort of partnership, then the incorruptible arm of law enforcement may have just snapped. If that is the case, then all this city may have left is Harvey Dent. Thanks for watching. Join us again in two weeks for the first televised interview with the newly elected district attorney, Harvey Dent, who will answer Mike Engel's questions and yours about how he plans to make the streets safer for all of us. Up next week, though, tune in to what will likely be an explosive debate between the head of the Falcone crime family, Sal Moroni, and commander of the Gotham Police Department, Commissioner Loeb. While the commissioner is now cooperating with Dent's mission to stamp out corruption within Gotham PD, Moroni contends the DA's case against him is a poor attempt to make him the fall guy for the rampant corruption that still exists. We'll find out which is the truth on Gotham tonight. I'm Lydia Fillingeri. Good night. Harvey Dent has wasted no time implementing his agenda since taking office, kicking off with the trial against Sal Maroney. The district attorney has built a strong case against the mobster and the alleged head of the Falcone crime family by forcing former district attorney Roger Garcetti to turn state's evidence against Maroney in exchange for immunity. Although this testimony seems damning, Garcetti said that he never received orders directly from Maroney. Commands came from an intermediary who is reputed to be a Maroney associate named Albert Rossi. If Dent can get the mobster to attest to being the middleman between Garcetti and Maroney, Dent can effectively tie Maroney to the ring of corruption within Gotham PD. If not, testimony from a corrupt public servant looking for a way out of some jail time will probably not be enough for a conviction. To discuss this further tonight, we are joined by the defendant himself, Mr. Sal Maroney, who claims to be an innocent man caught in the middle of a nasty fight between the DA's office and the police department. And since this case highlights once again the rampant corruption within the Gotham Police Department, we also welcome Police Commissioner Loeb to speak on behalf of Gotham PD. Good evening. Mr. Maroney, Commissioner Loeb, thank you both for joining us. Pleasure, Mike. Big fan. Thank you. So, Mr. Maroney, you seem very at ease for someone who's on trial. Well, innocence calms the soul. You know what I'm saying? Now, you contend that you've had absolutely no influence over the police. I mean, you haven't bribed any union officials or officers. I've given them money, sure. You have? Of course. I donate to the policeman's ball every year, Mike. Now, what the commissioner's pals do with that money, that's up to them. Hey, Loeb. Fun party this year. Mike, let me make something clear here. The policeman's ball is thrown on behalf of officers killed in the line of duty. Proceeds go to their families. It is strictly a charitable event. You see, Mike, I'm just a charitable guy. Mr. Maroney, Roger Garcetti's testimony has painted a pretty detailed picture uh, of your ties to Gotham PD. Now, are you claiming that this is a total and complete fabrication? Mike, I'm just a man mine of my own, caught in a crossfire between Mr. Dent and the boys in blue. Now, if you ask me, I think these accusations are absurd. And as a taxpayer of this incredible city, I'm a little ticked off at the amount of money they spent dragging me into court when they could have spent the same money on a homeless shelter or, you know, something. But those kind of things don't make headlines, you know what I'm saying? Commissioner Loeb, as much as this is a trial against Sal Maroney, it's also yet another trial against the Gotham Police Department and its corruption. Well, see, I was initially critical of Mr. Dent's internal affairs investigations as they were bad for the morale of my men. But now department is working in full cooperation with the district attorney's office to isolate any members of the department that continue to violate the code of the Gotham PD. Now, in doing so, I believe we will root out the corruption and properly cleanse ourselves from the influence of men like Mr. Maroney there. Now, any of those you've isolated have ties to Mr. Maroney, Mr. Loeb? Well, I, uh, 
I'm not at liberty to say right now. <laughs> That's funny, ain't it, Mike? I mean, these cops, they go around robbing, cheating, and stealing. And this guy, the top cop, he's still got a job. Talk about corruption, huh? Who's scratching your back, Chief? You laugh all you want, Maroney. You see, I don't itch. Yeah, right. Now, one of Dent's key witnesses, Albert Rossi, is also an alleged associate of yours. I mean, who's going to be testifying as a go-between between you and Mr. Garcetti. I mean, how do you feel about that, Mr. Maroney? And I can pull a guy off the street for two bills and a handshake will testify that you are the Batman, Mike. That don't make us so, does he? So what you're saying is that Mr. Rossi is not an associate of yours? Mike, who do you think I am? I'll tell you who he is. The head of the Falcone crime family. The head of the Falcone crime family? This guy's got what Dent's got, a big imagination. I'm in the import-export business, Mike, and that's all. The import-export business? Yeah. Not everybody can be Bruce Wayne. I mean, some of us, we got to work for a living, know what I'm saying? Now, how do you respond, then, to the surveillance tapes that were leaked last week that detailed, apparently, the abduction of two mob bagmen who were later found murdered? Ah, uh, tragic. Tragic. My condolences to their families. Mr. Maroney, before they were ambushed, they spoke about your decision to band together with other criminal organizations in Gotham. Well, we work in a global economy, Mike, for Pete's sake. I mean, I do business with all kinds of people. Chechens, Asians, Jamaicans, Puerto Ricans, Arabs, more Arabs. <laughs> Unfortunately, I find out sometimes these guys aren't always on the up and up. And when I find this out, I don't do business with those guys no more. Know what I'm saying? So you're not overseeing a criminal syndicate in Gotham. And this is actually just business. Mike, you're repeating yourself. You got nothing else interesting to talk about. I'm sure the viewers at home are turning off the TVs right now. I mean, you don't want to bore them to death, do you? No, we don't. Commissioner, uh, do the police have any leads in relation to the murders of the two men on their surveillance tapes? Well, Mike, um, I'm expecting a report on the investigation soon. Has Batman been considered a suspect at this point? Mike, that is an interesting question. Oh, Jimbo Gordon got a real thing for the guy, don't he? Jim Gordon is the most honorable cop we have on the force. I never said he wasn't the most honorable cop on the force, but hey, Chief, What's that saying right now, huh? You see, Mike, this man would like nothing more than to cast suspicion on an honest cop who was actively shutting down all the various money laundering operations in the city, making it much harder for Mr. Maroney to bank his ill-gotten gains. Oh, so now I'm a money launderer. Great. What's next? You're going to finger me for kidnapping a Lindbergh baby? Mike, do me a favor. Turn this guy off. Commissioner, are you saying that Mr. Maroney is the target of recent money laundering crackdowns? We have reason to believe that all of Gotham's dirty money leads back to Mr. Maroney. Save yourself a disappointment. Go through your officer's wallets. You'll find most of it there. Mike, you gonna let this guy insult your journalistic ethics? How so at this point, Mr. Maroney? <laughs> By spouting this garbage. I'm simply, on behalf of Gotham City News, presenting both sides of the argument. That's what the segment's about. This is not an argument, Mike. This is a persecution. No, I, I don't think so, actually. No, you don't think, Mike. You know what? I'm going to help you. I'm going to think for you. Oh, yeah? Here's what's going on. <laughs> Pretty boy Dent and Baldy over here, Baldy. they're trying to set me up like some kind of patsy. Well, guess what? I ain't no patsy. What I am, what I am is late. I got a day. We got to wrap this up, okay? Before we, it sounds more and more like dead air. Well, we're about out of time anyway. Um, good. Say good night. Commissioner Loeb, thank you for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me on, Mike, and I just want to say uh, we'll have our day in court. You enjoy yourself there when you get there, Mr. Maroney. Mr. Maroney, we thank you as well for joining My us. My pleasure. How do I get this thing off me? Can somebody get this off And me? thank you for joining us. Please join us next week when the first televised interview with newly elected District Attorney Harvey Dent, who will both answer your questions and mine about his plans to make the streets safer. In the meantime, take care and have a good night. Thank you for joining us. This is Gotham Tonight, and I'm Mike Engel. Recently elected District Attorney Harvey Dent has already begun waging his war on crime. The first assault made his opponent in the race for District Attorney Roger Garcetti surrender unconditionally and turn state's evidence against the head of the Falcone crime family. This testimony paved the way for what will be Dent's first major battle, the trial of Sal Maroney. Will Gotham's white knight broaden the front on his war on crime to benefit the city? Or will he only dedicate himself to conflicts that make for good headlines? Good evening, I'm Mike Engel, and this is Gotham Tonight. We're joined tonight by District Attorney Harvey Dent, who has graciously taken time out of his busy schedule to not only answer my questions, but uh, yours as well. 
So let's start, shall we? Why don't we start with the question that you posed in your opening, Mike? Am I an advocate for Gotham or, or just a publicity hound? Well, that wasn't exactly how I put it. But, uh, if I was after headlines, Mike, I would do more press, wouldn't I? I mean, weren't you the one who was criticizing me for not doing the interviews during the election? Well, that's true, yeah. Okay, then here's an answer to your question. Whatever decisions I make as district attorney will be made with Gotham's best interest in mind. The moment I fail to do that, no matter the circumstances, is the moment I become everything I stand against. Corruption, uh, brutality, total disregard for the law. To name a few, yes. Well, couldn't you ascribe those qualities to the Batman? Batman? Isn't that a little off point? No, I disagree, actually. I mean, I'm dumbfounded, personally, by the notion that a man who continues to take the law into his own hands, making a mockery of it altogether, is tolerated by both the public as well as the authorities. I guess the question we all want answered is, will you make this a priority to bring him to justice? Well, my priority is to help this city uh, return to a time when it didn't need a Batman, when the streets were safe and the institutions of government were right-minded. That sounds like good spin. It's not spin. You don't just decide one day to go uh, put on a disguise and go fight crime. A dysfunctional society dictates that response. So if you want to get rid of the Batman, then curing what created him is the best way. I understand that, but what if you sanction a vigilante to act as a guardian for a society, I mean, someone who willfully breaks the law, then aren't we in fact sanctioning lawlessness and chaos in the city? If the Batman bent the law to achieve some personal gain, you would have a much easier time uh, to get people to agree with you, Mike. Batman's actions thus far have been everything but personal. They've benefited the city entirely. How do we truly know what he's after if we don't get an opportunity to ask him? Well, let's just say there are plenty of other people uh, who are acting out of personal gain that I'm more interested in getting to know. You mean people like Sal Maroney, I assume? Yes. Well, since the trial's in progress, Mr. Dent, we obviously understand that you can't discuss the details of it at this point, so I'd like to open up the conversation to uh, a couple of callers at this point, if you don't mind. Sure thing. So on line one, we have Marsha Delinsky from Uptown. Marsha, you on the air? Yeah, hi, Mr. Dent. I'm a huge supporter of yours. Thank you, Marsha. I used to live in the Narrows, and I was fortunate enough to make it out okay during Dr. Crane's chemical attack. Now I hear Crane may be out there spreading the toxin again. What can you do to stop this? Well, what I will do is reopen the investigation into Crane's whereabouts. If Crane is dead like the authorities say, then we need to find a body. I don't think you will, so uh, I'm inclined to believe that he is out there, and finding him will be imperative. Now, Dr. Crane's alleged poisoning uh, of the drugs in Gotham is uh, clearly just another offense uh, in what we're seeing that it's a series of really bizarre and, and sensational uh, crimes being perpetrated these days. How do we counteract something that appears to have no known motive? Well, as demented as it may be, uh, I think the motive is to hurt people. And that's why this crime will be stopped and the perpetrators will be brought to justice. Caller 2, Brendan Palmer from River South. You're on the air. Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm a cop, 16th Precinct. And you talk about bringing criminals to justice. How are we, the police, how are we going to do that? When you got your hands wrapped around our throats, you locked up six of my friends already with your IA crap. Well, and tell your... me their names. Tell me their names and I'll tell you why I prosecuted them. I understand that a decrease in manpower makes it harder for you to do your job, but working with a group of individuals who break the law instead of enforcing it, that makes your job impossible. And to be honest with you, Officer Palmer, I feel a lot safer knowing that someone like yourself, whose name hasn't shown up in a file on my desk, is out there on the streets protecting me. You're a good cop. Albert Rossi and two others were apprehended by the Batman before they could assault voters at a local polling station. You're putting Rossi on the stand tomorrow to testify that he was a go-between for Sal Maroney and Roger Garcetti, now effectively tying the mob to the corruption within Gotham PD, as well as the violence against your own campaign for district attorney. Well, that's the aim. Aren't you opening up old wounds, I mean, from previous internal affairs investigations, I mean, that convicted huge numbers of, of the police department. Mike, my intention is not to cast suspicion over the entire Gotham Police Department. But when the corruption is so widespread, you have to go down there and dig down deep and root it out. Sal Maroney's conviction tomorrow, hopefully, would be the beginning of the end of that process. What is your working relationship with the police department right now? Commissioner Loeb was initially critical of my position. But now our offices are working close together, and there are several other police officials who are out there doing a good job, whom I trust. Like Lieutenant Jim Gordon and his uh, major crimes unit that we're hearing about. Yeah, we haven't had a, a chance to meet yet, uh, Lieutenant Gordon and I, but uh, I am familiar with his work, particularly in cracking down on the city's money launderers, which my office is aggressively prosecuting, and I anticipate sitting down with him soon. Will you discuss his rumored relationship with the Batman that we're hearing about? Mike, you're obsessed. Next caller. 
I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt right now, but we've been informed of some breaking news uh, here in Gotham. My colleague Lydia Filangari is reporting outside Gotham National Bank, where we're hearing that six men have robbed apparently $68 million out of the bank's vault. Lydia, what's the situation down there? It doesn't look like you're close to the bank. That's right, Mike. We're a couple of blocks away from Gotham National. Authorities still have a perimeter set up around the area because the bank robbers apparently use grenades to intimidate the hostages into submission. Now there's fear more explosives may be inside. What is the status on the six bank robbers at this point? Five out of six of them are dead inside the bank. Four took gunshots to the body, and one was hit by a school bus that the last robber then used to get away with the money. Any identification on the purse? Lydia, have any of the assailants been identified at this point? Do we know? No, there's been no reports on what the bank surveillance footage reveals, but according to eyewitnesses, each man wore a clown mask. So there's been no identification thus far. We're still waiting to hear more. Okay, Lydia, we certainly thank you. Please keep us updated. Of course. And we'll be tracking that story on Gotham tonight. Well, Mr. Dent, you certainly have your hands full in this city. We certainly wish you all the luck, and uh, we appreciate you being here tonight. Mike, putting pressure on the criminals so they think twice before committing awful crimes like this, that's our goal. And luck is our last resort. We thank you for coming on, Mr. Dent. And uh, we thank you for watching. Please join me next time for an interview with Mayor Garcia, who will detail his plans to clean up the city. Uh, what will his relationship be like with Harvey Dent? How will he administrate the police? And will he vow to incarcerate the Batman or allow him to roam the streets, taking the law into his own hands? We'll find out on Gotham tonight. Uh, so good night, everyone. Please stay safe.